Hello everyone, welcome to our seminar today called We Can't Breathe Until You Can. So you're in seminar one, stream one. This is a seminar hosted by the Racial Justice Group for our assembly in 2021. My name is Ruth Moriarty, I'm a Baptist minister in North London at Christchurch, New Southgate and Fryn Barnet and I'll be chairing our session today. George Floyd's final words were, I can't breathe. And his words have caused all of us to rethink racism and particularly our role of fighting against racism as Christians. For too long, issues of racial injustice have been explored by predominantly black and brown Christians. It is necessary for white Christians to explore race, to share the burden and to make positive changes to our behaviour. This seminar will explore white privilege from a white person's point of view. White privilege describes the advantages of white people in society that others don't have. Having white privilege does not make your life easy, but understanding it can make you realise why other people's lives are harder than they should be. So in this seminar, you will hear the voices and perspectives of white people and their understanding of racialized behavior. Stories of discrimination and its impact on people of color will be shared. Discussing white privilege from this perspective has become a necessary and honest lens from which to understand racism. And from that reason, uh, contributors in this discussion are all white. Let's begin in prayer. Please, would you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity you give us to learn and to change. Lord, we recognise the enormous pain and suffering of black and brown people around our world due to racism. Lord, we're sorry for the times when we have ignored race and failed to challenge racism present in our lives. Renew our minds and our hearts today. Shake us afresh and open our eyes to your hope for our future. Amen. Amen. I'm delighted to share that we have a fantastic panel here today. We will hear from the Reverend Dr. Tim Judson by video. Tim is a Baptist minister in Honiton in Devon and an expert on Bonhoeffer and racism. Mary Taylor joins us as a regional minister from the Yorkshire Baptist Association and she is also a member of the Racial Justice and Gender Hubs. And Gerard Gossock is pastor of the Six Ways Baptist Church in Erdington, uh, north of Birmingham, and part of the Baptist Union Racial Justice Group. In this seminar, we will consider terminology, history, a case study on Bonhoeffer, and practical action, steps that we can all take to address this issue. Now, you should see that there is a chat box. Please do make good use of the chat box. You can ask a question anytime, and then we, there will be time to hear those questions at two different points in today's seminar. We begin with a video from Tim Judson on terminology and our use of language and race. Thank you, Tim, for preparing this video. Hi everyone, I'm going to give a really brief summary of some of the key terms for this discussion on white response to race. Now language is not a static thing, is it? It's dynamic. Um, words craft and conform things. And we witness this in the scriptures of God breathing light and life into darkness by his word. And in the book of Proverbs, nearly 40% of the book relates to the wisdom of what we say. And of course we have Jesus' teachings and New Testament passages on foregrounding the powerful nature of words. Sociologically speaking, terms of discourse analysis examine the imaginative horizons that language can forge within us. From public politics to private conversations, the language deployed within any discourse calibrates our disposition to the world, what we think or believe or how we act. But words don't just create things, words themselves are somewhat organic constantly moving and changing in their associations. And we all know this, that language develops over time. Words change in their emphasis or meaning. So we need to be attentive to how words are landing here and now within our cultural moment. For example, I would never dream of referring to my wife as wench. 
even though years ago it was actually considered not offensive. And 90 years ago, it was appropriate to use the term Negro, whilst now it's actually derogatory. The term black holds foundational significance because it, it was actually the first term that was used for self-identification by choice. And this is why many black scholars and black theologians still use the term black today. The phrase black and minority ethnic was adopted a while back as a helpful category for statistics and such like. However, as the discourse developed, the term BAME evolved as a label which was less about recognising a range of backgrounds and more about a kind of bulk summary for other people, which no longer acknowledged distinct identities but kind of lumped people in one box together. The sociologist Rosemary Mallet explains that the BAME term has really served its purpose because it's since picked up negative connotations within discourse and a new term is therefore needed. And she suggests one helpful approach is to refer to people's heritage, if that's helpful or, or possible. So referring to someone as English, Welsh, Peruvian or Jamaican, that can be good. And the Anglican Church also uses the term UKME or UK Minority Ethnic which is an attempt to recognise the distinct ethnicity of people, whilst at the same time being inclusive of people whose identity is not black, like someone who's Chinese, for example. However, a lot of people actually prefer the term global majority heritage, which confers a less marginal slant on it, but it's also less UK-centric in its use of language. And now many of us here might be finding all of this a bit unnecessary and confusing because we, we don't want to label people and don't want to box people in, but, you know, we're all one in Christ, man, and that sort of thing. Um, but whilst such a perspective is definitely well-meaning, it's also quite revealing that, that many of us have never had a cause to identify ourselves in this way. And all this is because we and society as a whole have often inadvertently considered ourselves to be the normal ones, the benchmark, the objective standard. But people with my colour skin are not the standard, not the neutral state, which somehow doesn't need qualifying or recognising in its particularity. And that whole frame of thinking is critiqued these days using the term whiteness. Now, whiteness is not exactly the same as being pale skinned. I have pale skin, but with that, also comes additional cultural, social, economic, political factors which are embedded within society that afford me numerous avenues to flourish in the world. Avenues which have not been accessible to everyone. I go to the shops and discover the foods I like to eat. I watch films and see characters that look like me. I search for Adam and Eve on Google and I find endless paintings and pictures of people with my colour skin. Until recently, I have never had to qualify who I am in a racial sense because I've grown up in a world that is effectively centred around bodies that look like mine, that are white. So whiteness is an all-encompassing term describing an imagination that often unconsciously measures everything in the world against me as the standard, as the norm. And it's not just about skin colour, but it's about a perceived aesthetic as to what human flourishing is and this aesthetic is invisibly operative in many areas of society. We can link whiteness to the term white privilege. To give a very very brief concrete example, when I was studying at Bristol Baptist College, which I might say was awesome, I could walk along the streets of Clifton, which is where the college is based, a very expensive posh part of Bristol, don't you know, and incidentally built on the profits of the slave trade, and I'd rarely ever get anyone looking at me funny. But if one of my black peers walked along those streets, people would notice them, maybe clock that someone different is there. They might even cross the street or just take a breath as they walk past, possibly even put their hand in their pocket to grab their wallet, whilst also convincing them themselves that they do not have a problem with black people. If a police car drove past, they might be curious as to what this black person was doing in that particular neighbourhood. And yes, that does happen. I've experienced it. I have the privilege of not being checked, not being doubted, not being held up by notions of difference because I'm considered in so many ways to be the norm. And underlying white privilege is something called white supremacy. Now, I'm not talking about the Ku Klux Klan and the Third Reich, whereas I would have done 50 years ago. White supremacy today, particularly in Britain, is often far more, well... British. 
Um, and I'm sure many of us saw the Panorama episode on racism in the C of E, where numerous global majority ministers were being expected to conform to the style and sensibilities of white congregations, to act or speak or dress in a certain way, to conduct themselves differently so as to accommodate the dominant unspoken aesthetic of whiteness. Some were overtly told, but often they were just expected to fit in. There was this unspoken pressure because the white imagination was portrayed as the norm, the best way, however unintentionally at the time. You know, when I had voice projection training at college, the lovely and sweet person who came in to work with us told one of my friends that she needed to change the way she spoke a bit, to make her dialect more understandable, to not speak so flamboyantly, to essentially be a bit more adjusted to white norms. And looking back, that was a racialized criticism. And I wish I had the awareness at the time to gently challenge it. These conventions are just not happening at an individual interaction level either, but they are inextricably linked to institutions and communal units, which means that on a structural level in Great Britain, and also within our Baptist family, there is a problem of white privilege, which results in institutional raci racism. Um, there is not, this isn't quite as straightforward as simply saying that we are all racists. What I'm suggesting is that we are embroiled in a complex storytelling and that this storytelling occurs in ways we sometimes aren't aware of because we're colourblind. That is to say, as white folks, we are often blind to the manner with which whiteness marginalises and harms those who do not naturally fit into our particular assumptions of the human story. Is racism my fault as an individual? Well, it's a corporate problem as well, so that question kind of misses the point and divides us. However, is it my responsibility to redress the inherent whiteness that makes me blind to the suffering of others around me? I would say an emphatic yes. Hello. One year ago, on the 25th of May, 2020, news began to spread and a video was shared across the internet of the murder of George Floyd. At the time, in some way which I don't understand, uh, and not because it was not important, but because many similar deaths have gone so unremarked, there was a huge worldwide impact. It spread rapidly into marches and protests across the world under the banner of Black Lives Matter. I've been thinking, what did I see at the time here in the UK? I saw that despite all the anxiety of being in lockdown, many, many people came onto the streets to say enough and, and to use those words we've already heard the words of George Floyd, I can't breathe, to express their own pain. And I became more and more aware that there were, for people of colour, this opening uh, of wound and trauma as their own experiences became, as it were, publicly broadcast in the public arena because the lived experience of black and brown people was for a while being listened to widely and openly and stories were heard statistics were given and some actions were taken and all of this of course was replicated in baptist life on facebook it was in baptist news in statements and blogs what else did I see? There were some immediate and expected pushbacks on this uh, to divert, as it were, the attention from these deep injustices that had been revealed. All lives matter. Leave our statues alone. You're just jumping on a bandwagon, aren't you? Your virtue signalling. Those kind of words were used. Or what about? 
perhaps worst of all, including, as I heard, in many of our churches, just indifference. My minister never mentioned it at all. So these responses and the counter responses were, were all found in wider society and surprise, surprise, all found in Baptist life. Well, what do I see now? That for some white folk, maybe for a majority, this is this has gone off the boil. It's lost its urgency. We've lost that empathic urge. And a year on, there's possibly even greater pain and frustration. So the recently published Sewell Report, as it's called, it needs to be rigorously interrogated on its assertions that institutional racism is no longer a factor in, in the known statistical disparities in policing, in health, in education in the UK. And Wally Hudson Roberts, who heads up justice uh, matters within the, the union, he asked us four Baptists to lead this seminar and he's written, yet we black and brown people still can't breathe. So the challenging question is, what has truly changed? And, which makes this opportunity to share with Baptists together and, and your commitment to be in the webinar all the more important. Just a reflection then, why is it so hard for a majority white society and a majority white church to pursue this with intention and urgency as penitents, as learners, as partners, and not as saviors. I believe that one of the problems we have is we do not wish to look with honesty at our history or our good image of ourselves. We have what we call British exceptionalism. There's an abundance of very, very challenging material from which we would probably prefer to turn away. But instead, we do need to allow truth to shine, a searching light into our history, and, and how that continues to work on into present day inequality and into prejudice and injustice. And as Baptists, we also need to face our own problematic past and our challenging present. It's not just the Anglicans. As this year has unfolded, there have been some penny drop moments that I've been privileged to, to be with. Um, the former missionary who has reread her own letters home and realising now how, without any thought, she'd absor absorbed into herself that the prejudice and, and the superiority of white missionaries towards the Africans. Or, or seeing as if for the first time the absence of black and brown faces from the overwhelming majority of our leadership teams, our trustee bodies, our diaconates, our senior common rooms. Rob Ellis at, at Regions has described this as we have so many white and not rainbowed spaces. And another problem I have, I, I, Mary as a white woman have, is that I can choose not to engage. I can choose to have a break from it all because it's too hard or, or too threatening. And uh, I can stop listening. I can put up defenses to what I'm hearing because that is indeed my privilege. And I need, I believe, and I need to challenge you that we should lay that privilege down at the feet of Jesus because it is one of the reasons why my black and brown brothers and sisters still cannot breathe. These are not things which can be mended without uh, a challenging and costly journey, without a lifelong intention to give this matter of racial justice our full attention. Why? Because it's like, well, it's like all our sin. It's a sin, though, that really breaks God's heart and breaks the heart of our brothers and sisters. 
So just to, to conclude, I want to show you two pictures. And I want to show you something of my own personal history and background. And the truths I must not pretend away. It's my family history, and it has to be both celebrated and reckoned with. Never forgotten, but acknowledged and lived in the light of. So this is a picture of uh, my great niece. And she's marching in Parliament Square on June the 6th, 2020. Yes, during lockdown. And that is because even at her age, already she knows what a difference it makes to have a brown skin. She knows that these are matters of life and death. And then my next picture. Well, this is her great grandfather. In fact, it's my dad. And he's receiving a gift at the independence celebrations in Ghana on the 6th of March, 1957. He's one of the last cohort of colonial officers, leaving in freedom the country from which millions of slaves, black slaves, were taken for nearly four centuries. They went from a place in Ghana called Elmina Castle on the Gold Coast and across the Atlantic into slavery, those who survived through what is called the Gate of No Return. Now, why do I tell you this? Because I believe this story is not just my own, but it's ours as a nation. Mine is just one family and uh, it's representative. It's got a tiny and conflicted part in the trading and the imperial and the industrial and the colonial and the post-colonial history of our nation, our country. And it took my dad to West Africa they took my great niece's family from India to Trinidad as uh, indentured labourers. That was the kind replacement to slavery. And then to Luton, and then by God's grace has brought us together. And it's a tiny part, but it's really the reality in microcosm of our shared national history and our shared Baptist history too which I believe as Baptist people of light and of truth, we need to look at, to own and to address. Thank you for listening. So we have some time now for questions and answers. Time to think through some of the issues that have been raised by Mary and by Tim. We've had a few questions raised through our chat box. If you'd like to ask another one, please do. And the first one is this. Um, I, I think I've got the sense of this. First question is, why shouldn't it be UK centric? We are in the UK. Um, what I think that question is saying is this. Why shouldn't we be white centric? We are in the UK. So I wonder if Gerard and Mary might be able to respond to that question. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I go first, Mary? Okay. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, I, I guess UK centric needs to reflect what the UK is and what the history and the diversity. Uh, so the history, as in the past, what's made us who we are and some of what Mary has just described. Um, but also who we are now. Um, that might not be everybody's experience, you know, if you're in a rural, all-white context, um, but our, our, our shared context as the United Kingdom um, is one that needs to be reflected in our approach. And so that is a diverse context that 
reflects uh, people from all sorts of different origins uh, who are black and brown, uh, who identify themselves uh, not as being that white, <laughs> quite simply. So yeah, that's why it needs to reflect the reality of the of the UK. I think I'd add to that as churches, uh, one of our values, if you like, is, is welcome, hospitality, it is, it is sharing in community, it's a sense that all belong, and all can't belong on that, that level, with that warmth of welcome or, or of inclusion, if, if we only ever have white-centric uh, culture in our churches or, or uh, traditions or behaviours. Uh, and it's about, it's about being the people of God, the body of Christ, in a really full and rich way. Okay, our second question is this. Does white supremacy exist for me if I was in Africa or India or China? I think I, I just immediately into my mind came the, um, the stories of Joe Capolio, who has been a Baptist minister in London and is now in, we're blessed to have him in Yorkshire. Uh, speaking of... Uh, his experiences as, as a Zambian, that uh, that in one sense, in even within Zambia, whoever you were, whatever your tribal identity was, um, the the tribal identity was white that that you you not exactly aspired to, but that uh, that took the supremacy. So so his experience there, therefore, a white person in that country. Is, is actually has a privilege that they may not identify at all, even though they're in the minority, they still have a privilege. Mm -hmm. And if I can add to that, I think uh, for me, a key word all the time for us to think about um, as Christians and as human beings in this is about power um, and the power dynamic that is at work wherever we are. So yeah, globally, um, that you know, it, it's about uh, the, the power um, that, is, that is given to certain people, and that's been shaped by whiteness, uh, influence reflected in, in whiteness. So all of the time, no matter where we are, it's, it's kind of thinking about the power uh, relationships that, that are at work, and how we, as we live out our faith, either as individuals or in communities, churches, or how we uh, interact with the whole of society, uh, about you know, how, how we approach power, how we relinquish power, how we seek in a very Christ-like way to actually relate to how power is distributed, redistributed, is shared. Mm -hmm. Can I just add that, that um, this in no way means that an individual white person may not have felt that they've experienced prejudice yeah. or discrimination for their whiteness in certain contexts and with relationships, individual relationships. But it does mean that on the on the um, the global scale, on the national scale, on on the scale of of uh, what statistics show, that the the balance is not is not a level balance in terms of uh, racial prejudice. Um, we'll just take one more question that's just came come in, um, and it's this: What's the problem with saying all lives matter? I, I would just answer that as, um, as there, were, there were various cartoons that went the rounds at the time and uh, they, they gave uh, the story of, you know, if, if a house is on fire, um, you don't say all houses matter, you say this, this house matters and you go and you fetch the, the fire brigade. That, that sometimes felt a little bit demeaning, actually, of, of racial injustice. But the point is, it, uh, until... Uh, a group of people who are really suffering discrimination on, on a continuous scale and whose lives are actually uh, in places at risk because of it. it. We focus on that because that's the urgent and, and uh, the most significant at this moment. And, and when we focus on it and we focus with care on, on humanity uh, being, you know, being cared for equally, then actually then all lives will. Uh, be benefited. So that's why 
it's, mm -hmm. it's not a helpful, it wasn't helpful at the time, particularly. Yeah. Okay, so go on, go on, Gerard. Oh, just briefly, yeah, the fact that it came up at the time, I think, is a, is a thing that it felt a very pointed thing. Um, and Black Lives Matter, as a phrase, as a concept is just kind of talking about a deficit it's acknowledging that all lives matter but actually black lives have been made to matter less and so it's just trying to work against that deficit yeah thank you we're going to move to our second video from tim and this is a case study on bonhoeffer so please do enjoy tim Hudson. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a wealthy, white, educated and gifted German pastor theologian. He's particularly well known for his resistance to Hitler and he spotted the danger of Nazi ideology really early on. Many scholars claim that his foresight was cultivated through a year he spent in New York based at Union Theological Seminary, but particularly through his immersion in the worshipping life of Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. A black church. Whilst in America, Bonhoeffer became deeply concerned about the racism he observed, not least in the church, um, and he praised the black church's songs, calling them some of the greatest artistic achievements in America. But as well as his involvement at Abyssinian, he exposed himself to the broader experience and the wide literature of black life that was emerging out of the Harlem Renaissance, even to the point that actually one of his white classmates got very concerned that Bonhoeffer was spending too much time with black people. And it's worth remembering that his New York seminary wasn't in the racist South, but the supposedly progressive Northern US. Racism both uh, intrigued but also really disturbed him, leading him to want to explore it in more depth. But ironically, at this stage, he claimed that there was no situation similar to this racism in Germany. And then being in the black church, Bonhoeffer uh, encountered a different Christ, a black Christ, as he called it, which engendered a drastically different view of the gospel and his own self-understanding as a result. Observing his black sisters and brothers living under the oppressive structures of Jim Crow and racist America was rehabilitative for Bonhoeffer in terms of how he construed his faith and his allegiance to Christ on a social and political level. Confessing Christ through the church's liturgy could not be separated from confessing Christ by word and deed in the rest of life though this actually remains the case for many white Christians in America. Reinhardt's stats claims that Bonhoeffer simply just did not become aware of the gospel's opposition to racism until he was personally confronted with the situation of racism in America. In other words, he didn't think that there was a problem regarding race until he sat at the feet of his black brothers and sisters encountering Christ through the sorrowful rejoicing of black bodies. Upon returning to Germany, Bonhoeffer reported, this personal acquaintance with Negroes was one of the most important and gratifying events of my stay in America. So in contrast to the white churches, which he actually found boring, confusing and fairly depressing, he found the exuberance, uh, the joy and also the seriousness of the black church to be the only experience of true religion in America, as he described it. In contrast to white worship service, Bonhoeffer exclaimed, I heard the gospel preached in the Negro churches. And then he went on to explain that the white churches preached about virtually everything except namely the gospel of Jesus Christ, sin and forgiveness, death and life. Now, this is not necessarily a blanket statement for all white preachers and Protestant Christianity in America at that time has a particular context, but it does highlight the starkness of the black church's witness for him. Now, I could talk forever about Bonhoeffer, but I want to draw our attention to something else he observed. In his reflections on America, Bonhoeffer observed a growing opposition towards Christianity amongst black youth. He notes that 
a lot of Christian preaching made the parents of these young black people uh, silent, um, hopeless, self-loathing even, kind of forced, meek and mild spirituality in the face of daily racism. And the name of Jesus was being evoked like an opiate to cause black people to acquiesce in the evil of regular lynchings and Jim Crow laws. The sharpest edge of what was a social, economic and political evil in that country. The Christian command to bear the cross, to turn the other cheek, love their enemies. Christ's teachings were being deployed in the service of white supremacy. And these phrases were like blanket justifications for a white aesthetic, a white Christ, a white status quo. And Bonhoeffer could see this. He could see that racism was a Christian problem, a gospel problem, but that Christians were contributing to it. And in reflecting on this growing opposition to Christianity amongst the black youth, Bonhoeffer said this. If black opposition ever spreads its might, then white America will have to take the blame that these black masses became godless. What's Bonhoeffer saying here? Is he saying that it's okay to become godless? No. Is he saying that it's okay if violence happens? No. What he's saying is that a Jesus who commands peace, love and forgiveness is no saviour at all if he also silences the cries of the oppressed, ignores the wounds of the hurting and fuels the fires of injustice. Such a Jesus is not the Jewish Messiah whose screams and suffering on the cross confronted an evil world with its sin and is making all things new through his victorious death. Bonhoeffer suggests that if black people rise up and get violent because they have just had enough of white privilege and power and the pathological ignorance of whiteness, if stuff gets violent, then white people like me should bear the guilt. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, a riot is the language of the unheard. And don't get me wrong, all violence is lamentable. But we must ask ourselves a much deeper question. What was so bad that so many suffering people felt forced to consider violence as the only responsible action? In his well-known book, The Cost of Discipleship, Bonhoeffer says this. Jesus's community ought to examine whether it has given a sign of Jesus's love, which preserves, supports and protects lives to those whom the world has despised and dishonoured. Otherwise, the most correct form of worship, the most pious prayer and the bravest confession will not help, but will give witness against it because it has ceased following Jesus. We are not allowed to separate God from our sister or brother. Thank you, Tim. It was a really interesting reflection on Bonhoeffer and particularly around that image of the Prince of Peace. We've got some time for questions again. So if you'd like to ask some questions about Bonhoeffer and those views, and I'll start us off with um, a question for Mary and for Gerard. I was um, taken with that description of Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Um, if that image might smooth over difficult racial issues. I wonder if you have any reflections on that. I would say we have to hear this in the context, for example, of, uh, of the Bibles that were printed for slave populations mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, by the slave owners, the masters, uh, which removed any uh, reference to things like uh, I don't know, the children of Israel crossing the Jordan and, and being rescued by, uh, by God from slavery in Egypt and so forth. So, so they, were, they were given um, the Christian faith, uh, but it was a faith that was designed to keep them in, in quiescence and, uh, and without any kind of uh, comeback that, that we know the gospel brings freedom. And, and that was uh, trying to be denied them. It couldn't be, of course. So I think we have to remember that. It's not that Jesus isn't the Prince of Peace. I'm thoroughly committed to that. But we do have to, to realise that 
each of us sits in a different place and, and, and receives a different portion, if you like, of peace. And, and we, uh, we need to bear that in mind. I'd say amen to that and echo that. I guess it's thinking about um, the, uh, the concept of peace relating to shalom and and which is uh, you know something much much wider uh, so you know justice righteousness um commonwealth for all is in there too so therefore we look at the whole of, of that biblical heritage that we have that's wrapped up in shalom mm -hmm. so while we're thinking about the states um it's good to think about enslavement and i'll take uh, one of the questions from the chat box now which is this why is it so, uh, sorry, should Baptists be advocates for reparations for colonialism and slavery? Should we Baptists be advocates for reparations? For whom? For the, for the victims of? I, I guess it's for the victims of slavery. <laughs> Short answer, yes. Um, and obviously something that um, I'm really pleased to say that the Baptist Union of Great Britain has been exceedingly active in. I think it's important. In fact, it feels very gospel. It feels like um, uh, Zacchaeus up the tree who came down and said he was going to give back fourfold if yeah. he'd taken from anyone. So I, I, I can't see any reason. It's usually the fear is that, that uh, it will take away our economic advantage. It will take away our wealth. Or, or it will, I think, at the back of the mind, whether this be national reparations or church reparations, is, um, is, is the knowledge of, of how much we have benefited uh, from things like slavery. And, and therefore, what, what on earth would it mean to, to repair that uh, and give back? But I think the, the ways forward are often much more life-giving and much more mutual and, and much more beneficial to us in, in that generosity. It's not generosity, but, in, you know, we always know that what we give, we receive back hundredfold. So absolutely, we should be exploring it, we should be advocating for it, and, uh, and we should not be afraid of it. We've got a couple of questions um, that are really about a practical nature. So I wonder if we might move to Gerard, who's going to talk about um, some practical considerations, mm -hmm. and then we can take those questions after you've shared. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you. OK, so uh, since the murder of George Floyd as highlighted by Mary as part of the seminar, many issues have been raised. So many questions, so many opinions. Uh, and as Mary has also said, that we as white people feel like we have the option to close down, to avoid these issues if we so wish. But I would argue, whatever our context, whatever our situation might be, the issues of racism dig deep into who we are as followers of Jesus and simply as human beings. This is a deep issue of human sinfulness. Now all of this and more might mean that we feel whoa, overwhelmed. What can I do? Do I need to do anything? What is the right thing to do? I don't want to do the wrong thing, all of these things. Well, never fear. Here is a 10 point plan with some suggestions, largely personally owned by me, as to things I am learning about how to respond to the issues raised by racial injustice. Just by way of explanation, my context is that I live in a multicultural mobile part of Birmingham and my church is a black majority church, but yours might be completely different. No matter, I believe that there are things you can take from what I am offering here. So here we go. First thing is this, keep learning. Give the issue of racism some serious thought. Do some research. There's so much good information out there. There are loads of amazing Baptist resources and uh, churches together in Britain and Ireland ones too, and all sorts of good books, articles, programs, videos. Ignorance is not an excuse. And listen to the stories and the views of people of color. Ask questions. 
We live in a time that is rich in resources. Secondly, be self-aware. Be aware of whiteness. White privilege, as uh, explained earlier, is a thing. A while back, someone sent me a 1990 article by an American writer called Peggy McIntosh. It's called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. It comprises of a long list of her privileges as a white woman. I've made my own list. I'm still adding to it. Why not draw up your own knapsack list and keep revising it? Thirdly, take responsibility. One of the things that has come out of conversations with friends of mine who are black is that white people need to sort out this problem. We need to work it out for ourselves and not keep putting responsibility back onto the victims of racism. Number four, acknowledge mistakes. Dealing with racism and navigating our way through all of this is sometimes simple and sometimes very complicated. There are times when I get it wrong. When I've messed up and caused offence or not thought through the consequences of what I've said or, or done or have not said or not done, uh, I think I'm getting better at putting my hand up and just apologising, graciously accepting culpability and learning from it with humility. Denying our own racism is unrealistic, unhelpful, and I would say basically untrue. We need to treat racism like we do all of our sinfulness. Number five, find a balance. As I've already said, navigating our way through all of this is sometimes simple and sometimes very complicated. Be aware of it as a balancing act. Don't overdo it. There needs to be a blend of intentionality and simply being natural about it, how we approach racial justice. We need to bring other people with us on our journey, but at the same time, we should not worry about offending white people. Number six, call it out. One thing I've found as a white pastor is that quite often, Black and brown people have held back from framing a situation of injustice at work or in other settings as being an issue of racism. I think I, it has felt like the right thing for me to name it as being so. Asking questions like, and are you the only black person on the team? Or do you think this is a race issue? These things seem to have been helpful. As white people, I have found we can play our part in affirming lived experiences of our black and brown sisters and brothers and becoming part of a safe, honest space in which to talk about racism. Number seven, get empathy. Put yourself in the shoes of people of colour. How does it feel to be in situations when we are the only white person or the only female? How do we feel when we are in a meeting or any conversation and we are the person least listened to? Eight, challenge. There should be no bubbles where it is okay to revert to being racist just because we're surrounded by white people. We need to challenge things when we see them, when we hear them. Be courageous, intervene. Now, if you've followed any of the coverage recently around the death of footballer Dalian Atkinson, it is good to hear about the witness statement of a neighbour, but it does also raise a question about intervening and challenging and advocating in order, in this case, sadly, to save a life. And number nine, give it up. Give it up. Power, that is. Be prepared to give way. This can be a hard one for us as white people. There needs to be meaningful change, relinquishing power and control in all sorts of ways, not just including black and brown people in things, but working at meaningful partnerships and actually handing things over. Maybe we should all be looking at everything that we are involved in and be asking the questions about where the people of colour are 
Why is our leadership team all white? Why is the church group all white? Or why are people given certain roles and responsibilities? And finally, number 10, love one another. It's a simple command from Jesus, isn't it? We need to live it out in all of our relationships. I appreciate that this is, is harder if you are in an all white context, but still we should ask ourselves, if we don't know any black people, why is that? Get to know people, form real relationships. We choose all the time who it is that we relate to, who it is that we try to get to know. We need to be intentional about this. And finally, some scripture to guide us. Peter was anxious that the people of Jesus that he was writing to in Turkey would overcome ethnic differences and form a new identity in Christ. This is my prayer too. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart and a humble mind. As Jesus would say, go and do likewise. Thank you, Gerard. Um, some really great tips in there. I hope that's been helpful. We're going to have the rest of the time now for questions. So if you've got any more questions, please do ask in the chat box. We've got one that's a practical question from just before. So I'll start with that, which is this. If we are in a mixed congregation, how do we listen? And so we can then encourage those of African, Asian or Caribbean heritage to step up into leadership. What church barriers need demolishing? I can certainly testify my first church was a black majority church with a white majority leadership. And it took a black, um, black only list for nominations for deacons to sort that out. But it did change and it meant that we heard the black voice of the congregation far more easily. So I wonder if Gerard and Mary, have you got any suggestions of what church barriers need demolishing? I, I don't know about uh, barriers that need demolishing. I guess one thing for me is uh, the, the kind of how hard it must be to be the pioneer. And again, that comes down to empathy and things, but having an understanding of that, that, you know, you can set, you sort of, I've heard it said in lots of situations that, oh, well, I've asked, I've asked a black person if they'd step up and no, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to. Um, uh, and, but, you know, it's maybe not appreciating that if you spent your life kind of struggling and being that only black person in the room, um, that you get judged, uh, you know, the whole uh, of the black community is judged by your actions. Um, so it's kind of working against that, those kind of, um, perceptions uh, yes. and maybe just thinking sort of getting away from that tokenism uh, I think that's an important thing mm. sorry but like Mary was about to speak and I dived in go for it Mary <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that's right I, I think it's um, also perhaps thinking about the whole process of how people come into leadership uh, very often they're identified quite early on and they're they're mentored or or they get lots of opportunities to take part they are they are in the minds of those who are electing are often seen as good candidates because we have a particular template of of what a good candidate might look like or or be like so it's, it's thinking about the whole process not only what's out there but what's unconscious as well in in the way that we raise leaders up and certainly uh, in terms of young people, uh, making sure that our youth work as well uh, is not white-centric. So, so that even if we have an all-white youth group, it's still important to, to use things like um, the Baptist Union material, which, which introduces uh, the idea of, uh, of a richness of culture coming not just from a, a, a white and a UK background, so all of those things, it's, it's building lots of, of different things in that, that change the way uh, our churches feel to those who are a bit more on the margins and on, on the outside. Mm. Mm. 
So we've got two questions that are almost the same. I'll read them both out. One is, how can eyes be opened in all white congregations? And the second is, how can we carry on the conversation about white privilege and racism in a white majority church? I think what I'd say is, uh, this isn't a one hit thing. It, it's, a, it's a commitment, it's a lifetime commitment actually. But one of it I think is starting to encourage in your all white congregation a curiosity and about uh, and and a desire just to know a wider range of people uh, as an enriching experience if nothing else and uh, and therefore when when you're preaching you can think about how you preach can you can you change that when you're thinking about who comes to to preach and lead or, or share uh, can you can you bring people in from a diverse background there's lots of different ways in, in which to to open up uh, the riches of the world church or even the UK church to a congregation that is predominantly white. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And, and the, you know, I think, as I mentioned, there's, there's so many resources out there um, which, which can be used. And, you know, so there must be something out there uh, that any church could use, every church could use. So, uh, you know, just a bit of research. Might I suggest just, I'm just going to plug this. I got this in the um, BU mailing this week, which is I Can't Breathe, and it's a um, reflection on racial justice for 2020. It's an enormous resource. Um, it came with the annual report that you should have received before the assembly, and it's got uh, Bible studies in it and lots of, sort of very thought-provoking essays and prayers in it. Um, I would suggest that's a really good resource to start with. There's also the Just Aware course, isn't there? Mm. It's just aware which you can invite um, the, the racial justice uh, team to to share with your whether it be church or or um, association or in whatever way. Oh, the other thing I I'm going to suggest is on the Yorkshire Baptist Association website there is a a resource called Just Like Jesus and. Um, if only for a whole range of resources and ideas, there's a, there's a year's programme of challenges and uh, and anybody's welcome to dip into that and, and make use of them. Mm. I think there's also responsibility as ministers, if you are a minister listening to this service, um, is to think about the kind of passages and scriptural themes that we choose to bring out. Um, each week. Um, last week before last I preached on um, Philip and the Ethiopian in Acts, um, in Acts 8 and that was a real eye-opener for some of the people in my congregation, you know, prominently placing a person of colour um, as part of the heart of the gospel message was really important and also even, um, you know, using different images, we're all using a lot more pictures, aren't we, in worship, so why not choose a black person to tell a story rather than a white person I mean simple things like that as well can really really make a difference have you got any other top tips just as we close for um developing a, an honest conversation about whiteness in our congregations I think just being open just being open to so many things all the time I think I think that's you know and 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 for me the that's kind of humility to be Christ-like, that acknowledgement that we're going to get it wrong. You know, we can feel like, oh, I don't know what to say um, because I think I'll put my foot in it or I'll use the wrong terminology, but um, just to, to be open and honest about it, I think is really important. Okay, I think we'll close there now. Let's um, say a fond farewell and we hope that your explorations as churches and as Christians go well in this matter. God bless. <laughs>